Good morning, everybody. I am the moderator, Brian Hatton. I am from Lancaster, New Hampshire. And welcome to this workshop. Last morning, one before lunch. Um, this should be an interesting one. I'm very interested in it myself. So it's free money. Everybody likes free money. Um, we have quite a few speakers today. So we'll get going. And uh, the first person is Christine Beeler. <laughs> Oh, is that it? Hi, so I'm Chris Dealing. I work for the Environmental Protection Agency in the Boston office, uh, EPA New England, and many, many familiar faces here. And can I just say, it's so nice to see faces, it's like in person faces. This is a, I don't know, one of my first times back out in the world. So thank you, NRA, and thank you for being here. So we're going to talk today about. EPA and some grant funding we have uh, that's out there. <laughs> so for those of you who have worked in the Sustainable Materials Management Program for years, grant funding was piddly, right? Like bits of funding. And because of uh, kind of the harmonic convergence of many things, we now have uh, funding, which we'll talk about. Um, so in FY20, I'm just putting this stuff up so you can look at it if you're a wonky and you care about where it all kind of plays out. But the bottom line is um, there's 17 pieces of recycling legislation in Congress. We've got attention. We have people understanding <coughs> that it's climate change. And we have appropriations, which is the key to funding. So that is great. Um, and again, in my career, I do. new. So this is not uh, news to anybody here. Why do we have this funding? Well, there's challenges, right? Or there's challenges with recycling. Um, there's challenges with markets, there's confusion over what's recycling, there's confusion um, into contamination, and there's environmental justice concerns where some of our facilities are cited. So we have developed a recycling strategy. Many of you might have commented on this. It talks about I'll do two computers, sorry. Just make sure I keep my, my, uh, my notes here. Um, it talks about exactly why. Why? this is an issue and why we should care about it. And it talks about stakeholders, which is everybody in this room and what we can do about it. And the key to the strategy and why I bring it up is it talks about improving markets. It talks about increasing collection and infrastructure, reducing contamination and in the recycling stream, uh, talking about the circular economy and how to enhance programs, EPR, take back, that type of thing. And then the other one, it talks about measuring, right? For those of you in the recycling world, Everybody measures a little bit differently. Every state measures a little bit differently. So we're trying to make that a little bit more common. So those are key things to think about because when we talk about grants that are available, those are the sort of problems that we're trying to solve. So we have a recycling strategy and now we have the solid waste infrastructure for recycling grant program. So that's a program that's being developed right now, brand new. Um, and I will be honest, it's a little bit like sausage making, right? Um, we have the money. And we have to get it out the door. And I'll face it, anyone here apply for a federal grant? It's really easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, we have to get all our ducks in a row to, to get, that, um, get that. I apologize. I apologize for the bureaucracy and appreciate anybody who does jump through the hoops to get us there, including my two colleagues on the dais who uh, are successful grant recipients. So we have a total of $275 million of funding, $55 million per year for five years. That is in the books, that is in the bank, and that is exciting. Uh, what happens to that? Well, we're gonna have this Recycling Infrastructure Grant Program to talk about our Save Our Cities Act, which is the act that appropriates the money. It's gonna uh, support improvements to post-consumer materials management, including municipal recycling programs, and assist locals, that's what you can look for. Uh, who's eligible? Uh, United States and political subdivisions of states, so any municipality, any kind of state government, uh, would be eligible for what we're calling SWIFR grants. Um, and again, sausage making, so it's still in the process, but that's who's eligible by law. We have a second grant program that's coming out, Education and Outreach. 
This again is for folks like you on the room and for not-for-profits like NRA. This will also be a competitive grant program, um, getting at those issues, contamination, all the issues that we, we know that are out there. The Education and Outreach Program has $75 million in funding, and 25, 20% will be set aside for rural communities, low income communities, and Native American communities. This administration is really very aware about the environmental justice issues, environmental protection, environmental pollution, or pollution. So, um, very specific set asides for uh, communities. And again, in New Hampshire, it would be rural. Here we go. The second grant program is a little bit broader. Uh, like I said, units of local governments, um, nonprofit organizations, and the like, private and public partnerships are eligible. And what's available? All kinds of things for education and outreach stuff that the few in the room are very, very familiar with. Labeling signs, public service announcements, advertising campaigns. Um, again, to get the message out about recycling is important. Uh, the key is here, this is sausage making. So there will be two RFAs out on the street. I would expect them out in September. My very last slide has a, a note how to keep connected if you want to follow that, uh, if you're interested in applying. So when we get to the very last slide, you'll see a uh, keep informed um, note to, to sign up. But I don't have a lot to say except good news. There's money. Good news, there'll be an RFA out on the street, most likely in September. And keep it, keep uh keep abreast of the situation. I want to end with something a little bit more tangible. We just closed our Healthy Communities Grant program, a grant program we had for the past 20 years. Um, and it, it did close this week or last week. So sorry if you didn't apply, but NRA did apply. So we'll, we wish them success. Not allowed to say that, not biased or anything, but you know, but, um, and, uh, but we do wish them success in their, uh, their proposal. And I wanted to say we have um, this Healthy Communities Grant Program, which is one of my favorite things to administer. And I have two colleagues here who have um, who have grants in that program, and they're going to tell you about the successes that they've had. So without further ado, Chris Craig. Um, and so and again, last slide. It says keep informed and sign up. We'll see what happens. <laughs> This uh, reminds me of being back in the classroom. <laughs> so, so thank you for, for listening. I, I brought my timer with me because Chris said if I go over 10 minutes, then no more grants for you. So, <laughs> you don't want to let that happen. So I'm the co-director of the Rhode Island School Recycling Club. And so uh, I'm just going to tell you a little story about how we started. So I came from a very different background. My background's in broadcasting. I worked for a group of radio stations and uh, we, we would uh, be mandated by the um, FCC to help nonprofit organizations with airtime. And uh, we started running, running um, ads for different environmental organizations back in the 1990s. And every year we would produce a big birthday festival. And it was really the sponsor was the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. And in 1998, I left the radio business, but I continued to run the Earth Day Festival. And in 2000, we had this big festival and uh, spent a lot of money on it. We brought in a band, uh, it was uh, the Outlaws. And uh, we had 10,000 people show up for this beautiful Earth Day Festival. What do you think happened when everybody left? That are trash all over the place. So we were having a, a, a meeting and saying, you know, is, is spending $100,000 on a, on a one-day event the best way to really affect change in the environment? And somebody brought this article, which was on the front page of the Providence Journal. It was titled Recycling's Hard Lesson. And it was about this reporter that went to this school where the school had been recognized for their outstanding, their amazing, their wonderful recycling program. And he said to the teacher, well, what happens to the recyclables when they leave the classroom? The teacher said, I don't know. Go talk to the custodian. So he went and talked to the custodian. The custodian said, we don't have a recycling program. Everything gets thrown into the trash. And so the Rhode Island Schools Recycling Club was born. It was really a partnership between the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management and Rhode Island Resource Recovery, which runs the state's landfill. 
in what we decided to do was to go out and do the first ever study of all schools in the state to find out who was recycling and who wasn't. And we basically used a, a carrot and a stick approach, is that if schools weren't recycling, we would offer them assistance through Rhode Island Resource Recovery, uh, and they would start recycling. But, but ones that did not want to, we would print a report card. And if, if the school said, we are not recycling, and we were kind of dumpster diving, going in and finding out who actually was recycling, they get an F on the report card. And then what would happen is that we would send a press release to the local newspapers and the newspapers would, would, would run the, the story and resource recovery say, you know what? Nothing has ever worked to get schools on board for recycling except for this. Because once an, an article ran, they would get in touch with resource recovery and say, what can we do? So it started with the front page story in the Providence Journal, which was this, where island schools love recycling. In the early days, we went from 15% of schools having any kind of a recycling program over 80%. However, there were so many problems with the program. And one is, is that the recyclable material was being picked up by custodians in the afternoon. And what do you think the custodians were doing? They were taking it and they were throwing it into the dumpster. So it was kind of a, a, a bit of a, a game of cat and mouse. So that's how we began. What we saw as we started doing this was that 70% of the waste coming out of the schools came from the lunchrooms. And so in about 2005, we started a program where we went to schools with five gallon buckets, with colanders, and uh, we, would, we would teach them how to divert liquids away from their trash. I will just tell you that it is chaotic in school lunchrooms, <laughs> trying to get the attention of the, of the, of the students. And so that's something that we continue to work on. In 2019, we got a grant from the Attorney General's Office in the state of Rhode Island from a fine that was levied against Volkswagen for their emissions um, scandal. And we did the first ever study in the state to really find out how much food is wasted on a first student basis in the lunchrooms at school. So we're gonna have a little audience participation here. There's only two people. The first is you have to vote on one of these things. Second is, you can only vote once, right? So you have to vote, you can only vote once. So who wastes more food in schools? Raise your hand if you think it's high school students. Raise your hand if you think it's middle school students. Raise your hand if you think it's elementary school students. It looks like, actually it looks like high school is the one that you chose. By far, it is elementary school students. Why is it? it has to do with hot lunch. When a first grader gets served a hot lunch, they get the same amount of food as a 12th grader. And the other thing is, is that in most schools, what they're doing is they're serving food, they're putting five different items on a plate, and the kids are throwing it away. In many schools, they don't know that students don't have to be given milk. So you have kids who take the milk container, they walk through the line, and they just throw the entire container away. To put this in perspective, if you have an elementary school with 500 students, they waste 43,200 pounds of food per year, 21 tons of food. It's a big problem. So I want to just talk a little bit about what we do and, and how we do it successfully. Because my background, background is in broadcasting, what we, what we figured out early on is that we had to create a conversation in the general public about the issue of food waste and recycling. And so what we do is we call it an arrowcast. And so we create a little story that we then use to get newspapers and television stations to cover. So we get to the minds of the assignment editor at a television station and we always go for a story which is called the kicker story. So you'll notice at the end of a broadcast, what happens is that the last story is typically a little uplifting, it's a little bit fun, and that's what we try to do. So we take the little story, and then we use that to get more statewide coverage. So in 2014, there was a bill that had been written to mandate that food waste would be diverted away from the land. The legislature hadn't even, hadn't, even, hadn't even agreed to hear the bill. And so we decided to put on a, a, a press event at the state house. And so we trucked in about 200 students that were diverting food scraps, and they were diverting food scraps to a big farm. 
And so we thought, how are we going to get the TV cameras there? And we thought, what if we bring in a bunch of pigs? And we set up the pigs in cages on the, on the steps of the state house. Maybe that would be enough. And the other thing is that we, we got a, an elementary school teacher to agree to kiss one of the fingers <laughs> live on television. So um, this is what happened. And by the way, when you see her go to kiss the pig, we were afraid that the pig was going to bite her. He was very upset. So you'll see me with sunglasses on reaching over to make sure that you know, nobody was harmed. Back down, details of five o'clock. Court on Smith Hill. A couple of real life uh, pokers took over Smith Hill this morning. Part of an initiative pushing food scrap recycling in Rhode Island. We see a lot of strange things in the state house lately. This is a big talk, right? Little guys' appetites are actually helping lighten the load in central land. And this is Susie Stein who spoke with those backing the proposal to send the state's food scraps to the farm. <laughs> Swine at the state house. Today, we mean that in a literal sense. These pigs are part of a recycling program started by students. They're being recognized for their efforts to reduce food waste in lunchrooms by taking scraps to the My Blue Heaven pig farm in Pasco. I don't my congratulations to you for starting it off. Representative Donna Walsh sponsored a bill that would require businesses to divert food waste from the Johnson landfill and begin composting. It starts by mandating massive companies, those producing more than 52 tons of food waste annually, to compost. <coughs> by 2021, everyone would be included. But there's a catch. Rhode Island doesn't currently have enough composting facilities to take on that demand. And we don't have the facilities, it will not go into effect until we do have the facilities built and online and ready to go. And some businesses like the Small Point Cafe are already doing this. So we just decided to get to limit it as The cafe on Westminster Street composts almost all of its waste, but it's sent a business out of state to do so. It's kind of sad because our landfill is on the verge of filling up, um, and most uh, waste from restaurants is food waste. So their business goes to Massachusetts. In short, for the bill to make a difference, composters would need to set up shop here. In the meantime, where creative composting will be celebrated, but not required. <laughs> Susie Stonnell, NBC 10 News. <laughs> It's the law. So 2014, the food waste ban, 52 tons, schools were exempt from that. And so we really pushed in 2019, 2020, changed the definition of schools to include school districts. So now 80% of the schools in Rhode Island are now under this food waste ban because they put that in the So we're currently, thankfully, working on the um, Healthy Communities Grant right now. We are working with four schools and really testing best practices in preparation for the new law on how best to educate children about the importance of diverting. We have waste warriors, cafeteria rangers, students run the waste separation within the, the lunchroom. We do we do waste audit audits. We put together a toolkit with lots of videos and how-tos. I would just say nobody reads it. We'll have a school that wants to get involved. We'll give them the toolkit. It's going to we'll say it's paper an hour to read it read it, and so we learned from that, and now we're breaking it into little pieces. Um, the challenge that we found is that it's very difficult to get middle schoolers and high schoolers to start doing this. Really, have to do it at the elementary school. At the elementary school, it's a dream of doing it. So we get them in elementary school, live with them, and then the other thing that's kind of cool that we're working on is a study of psychological empowerment. Any, any school that's getting involved, that all of the students take a survey about how they view the environment, we're able to track them throughout their entire school years because we have their lunch rooms, and their lunch number that is used for hot lunch. <coughs> and at the end of each year, they take the same survey and we're able to see the, 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 the progress. So thank you very much. And no pressure to answer, but before doing Can you fix your mic? Yeah. 
I said, write down. I work with the Northeast Waste Management Commission's Association, the North Dakota. Um, and as Chris mentioned, um, we received a FY22 Healthy Communities Grant. Um, and we are partnering with the Network Mining Community Services, or MLCS, on the MC Waste Initiative in East So MLCS um, is a residential um, service in the Network Mining Community of East Boston, in the larger Boston area. And it falls under. Um, the project falls under EPA's region wide target programs of environmental justice. Um, and for those that are familiar with the area, East Boston ticks off all three um, categories for Massachusetts environmental justice communities. So they're low income, have a high population of minorities, and also have a high population of folks that um, have limited English proficiency over the age of 14. So this project, the vision for this project is to really achieve zero wasted food through food recovery. So Chris talked about um, composting for food waste, and we're trying to recover food before it becomes food waste. MLCS partners with a global organization that recovers food called Care Foods in the Boston area, um, and they divert about 1,700 pounds per week. Um, of which about only 50 of that, 50 pounds of that is actual wasted food that's not good to uh, be distributed. So what this does is it helps empower residents um, in low-income communities by reselling at full cost instead of giving them food for free. And MLCS doesn't want to do that in order to help residents support themselves. So it's all about empowerment while also recovering food. And that is still safe. Another big um, deliverable out of this project, and it's one of the biggest deliverables out of this project, is to create the six month education plan for the youth that uh, MLCS hires. Um, and we have, we have a steering committee, and we decided on you know, five topics surrounding introduction to sustainable agriculture, um, food security, and food recovery, um, community gardens, and urban settings, and food technology workplace while also helping climate change. Um, connection and relationship with climate change and food systems, as well as a local chef specialist. But it's very familiar with the East Boston community um, to teach the children how to use you know, local foods that are seasonal, as well as um, using all parts of the food for also nutrition um, that the students would be able to participate in the on the time of year. And we're hosting that one at the end of August, so we're super excited about that. Um, another big focus that we're, we're trying to uh, teach the students is understanding date labels. There's a lot of myths around date labeling. Um, all of our focus of this project is something that a lot of uh, local communities and really in general have a lot of understanding. And then at the end, we're really hosting a, uh, another big deal out of this project is a celebratory event to celebrate this larger and awesome community as well as the Maroney community. Um, to kind of come together and say, hey, this is what we're doing. We're diverting about 1,700 pounds per week of food and giving it to people that we can get. Another deliverable um, for this project is to partner with the property manager at MLCS and the city of Boston to implement a long term strategy for the collection of food waste. So, what, what can this community do if they do have food waste? Um, right down the street is a Project of so it's a few blocks from the project that um, they have um, six or seven bins around the city to collect food waste um, for residents. Um, but it's not big enough for a big community. And with larger um, housing developments, we need access and support from the city to be able to set up areas in which we can provide those services for their, um, for their residents. So that's another big deliverable that we're starting with this conversation. Creating a short term strategy in order to have that long term strategy and work with government institutions. Oh, hot. <laughs> That's all for me.
Thank you all for attending this workshop. Uh, just a quick show of hands who's from Vermont. Uh, New Hampshire. Oh, love New Hampshire. Massachusetts. Connecticut. Um, Maine. Okay, excellent. Uh, as, as the uh, program says, my name is John Michael Musical Tunes Max. So if you run into me, please feel free to use that nickname. I, I've got it as a young man with bright red hair. I have a nickname just outside the city of Boston. I needed an alias. As the as the bio says, I've been working for the United States Department of Agriculture for about 32 years. I started when I was 15. Um, uh, and, and I've lasted that long because you know the department of my particular agency changes every few years. We get a new political appointment. So it's always been an exciting opportunity to have programs to be delivered to the community um, that make a difference. And uh, so I'm going to start out today about the big picture 30,000 per year, and then we're going to drill down to programs that probably would be uh, beneficial to hopefully your organizations and your communities. Don't try to absorb everything I'm telling you right now or sharing with you. But the most important thing you get is my contact information. Uh, what USDA Rural Development prides itself on is we're a federal agency with global presences. Uh, my jurisdiction is from on and New Hampshire, uh, but we have 48 of the country, and we'll be able to get you to the people in Mass Connecticut Island, your Bermuda, or wherever you come from. Uh, the programs are identical because they're federal programs. Uh, but like I said, the most important thing you get is contact information. Um, we're really user friendly. You can call us six times a day if you have questions you're not going to follow up on us. We go through these applications every day. You might go through them just once in your career. So please use our resources to be able to help you navigate the family programs. Uh, so, you know, the first thing I always ask people is what do you think about when you hear about USDA? Anyone? Food, right? Uh, meat inspection. Uh, let's see, maybe it's, you know, uh, commodity programs. Maybe it's things like that. Um, well, you know, USDA has many parts to it. Whoops. And actually, rural development falls under one of seven mission areas of the department. Uh, very important to understand because, like I said, we, we all do different things at the department level. Um, in our particular agency, I affectionately call it, we're the economic arm of the department, right? So, and the reason why rural development is under the USDA is because we only focus on rural America. And that's another uh, thing that probably conjures up in your mind is what, what is rural, right? And we define rural by population and income. And we can get to that a little bit here. So, but it's just more important to understand that, you know, we have many parts to the department Think of us as the economic arm of the department. There will be some good news and bad news because seeing we're rural, we don't focus on urban. So if you are in a community above our population, unfortunately, we can't participate. But there's probably some people out there that could. Most of New Hampshire, which is the predominant attendees in the crowd, is eligible for our programs. Southern New Hampshire, not so much. So rural development's mission is to increase economic opportunity and improve the quality of life of rural Americans. And we do that through financing mechanisms. So uh, any program that we offer is three ways to invest financially in a rural area. We have loan guarantees, so that a bank can come to us and wants to do a, say, a food co-op project in a rural area, but they feel a little nervous about the collateral. Uh, they might come to us to be able to assist with financing that project. Typically, our guarantees are picking up where small business administration leaves off. So we're typically in the five to $25 million range. So, you know, we, we are a major player in those. Uh, direct loans, we act like the bank, but we're not. We're a federal agency. As you know, if you fill out one federal application, you fill out one federal application. Um, so, you know, they're, they're uh, more processes and strings attached. We talk about free money. I don't think there's anything ever free, right? There's always some sort of catch or caveat or something. Else. 
And then we have the all elusive grant programs. Everybody wants a grant. I want a grant. Um, not everybody can get a grant. So um, moving right along, rural development uh, is actually a mission area under the department. And under that mission area, we have three agencies that are operating. So we have a rural utility service, which focuses on infrastructure. Uh, you think about broadband, you think about water and sewer treatment plants for a community. Uh, think about distance learning, telemedicine, you do things like that. We have a rural housing service, which by name, we help a lot of people buy their first homes. We help people that live in their homes, stay in their homes by doing repair programs. And we also have multi-family housing complexes and such. In addition, which is the program work that's probably going to be most interesting to you all today, we have a community facilities program for essential not-for-profit and municipal entities providing services. And then we have a rural business and cooperative service as it says, that's the business, business uh, aspect of the uh, mission area. So I say population was an eligibility criteria, rural utility service, 10,000 or less of population. But even more so, if I can spend somebody else's money, I love doing that. So, so again, contact information. Love to hear about what you have going on in the community. If it's something we can help with, great. If not, we we'll try to find a resource that might be able to help you out. So, um, as I mentioned, look, all those different program areas, we have like 40 plus different low and grant programs that focuses on these four categories here. Um, you know, I think about the business community I talked about, you know, the, the co-ops and the things like that that we might be able to assist with loan guarantees. We do have technical assistance programs that can help out as well. Um, our community programs, that's the program you're probably most interested in. That's for not-for-profits and municipalities. We fund things like daycares, libraries, museums, high schools, arts and cultural facilities, and solid waste and composting facilities too, which we're going to get to. <laughs> housing programs, again, we all live in communities where people are trying to move there, work there, they need housing. We have housing programs that are subsidized, they can get people into a house that they normally probably wouldn't be able to get into. And then utilities, if you're hearing in the news, infrastructure is the big deal, right? We get it in rural development. Um, and I mention all these programs to you because not only are you here for a professional reason, but you all live in communities that need things. So please, if I've sparked any thoughts in your head, let me know, because besides why you're here today, if there's a way we can help your community be healthier, prosper, uh, and things like that, we want to do that. So, why am I here today? Okay, so as I mentioned, our community facilities program is probably one of our wide, wider used programs for municipalities and not-for-profits. And I mentioned that, you know, 20,000 or less in population, talked about the type of activities that we can finance. Pretty much we finance things you can touch, right? Equipment, building construction, building purchases, renovations, uh, vehicles, things like that. We've, we've done a lot of different ambulances, fire trucks and things of that nature, community centers, arts organizations, and as I indicated, solid waste and recycling facilities. I don't think Bob Spencer's here for Point of solid waste management districts. You see, sir. You left. Any of any of you apply to our agency? No. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Well, you can always share when I get through this about how to go, right? Because don't believe me. Ask the customer. So as I mentioned, the community facilities program has guarantees, direct loans, and grants. Uh, as I indicated before, too, not everybody's only for like that. Our loan program, um, if you're a not for profit, is probably the best financing you'll find. It's, uh, it's a fixed interest rate. Currently, it's 2.5%. You can finance 100% of a project. And the term can be for the useful life of the asset. So if you think about real estate improvements, 30 years, 
equipment, you know, seven to 10 years, depending on what that might be there. Um, the grant program is based on median household income and population compared to the state that you live in. And again, these are all communities of 20,000 or less, and they're matching grants. So um, depending on the poverty of the community, really, uh, you could be a 15% grant eligible, 35%, 55 or 75 percent grant eligible community. And that's a percentage of the total project cost, or it maxes out at $50,000. So they're not huge grants, but they're grants that can help out. Uh, you know, Wyndham Solid Waste Management was able to get some funding for <clears throat> to replace a loader. Not a sexy piece of equipment, but a very necessary one if you're doing composting and other things around recycling as part of being able to use that from materials there. Um, the match to those grant program, that grant program, um, it can be almost any anything except for in kind. So we play very well with other federal resources. Um, anytime you look at mixing and matching resources, you always want to look at what their grant agreement tells you, to see what you might um, be able to match there. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring some examples. So, New Hampshire dominant, right? Uh, just some examples of things that we, we've been able to assist with our funding. And these were grants. Uh, you know, Effingham, they had a problem that they couldn't even access their facility because of bridge went up. Really critical piece of infrastructure that was needed there. Uh, we worked with the applicant to figure out how we could, in fact, do that and help them out. They were able to get that reviewed so that their facility could be fully functional. What up, New Hampshire? A glass crusher. Not a fun thing to say. I want to crush glass today. Um, you know, again, another piece of equipment that was uh, necessary to be able to process the materials that are coming into the facility there. And then we also were able to do some stormwater work. We're always very interested in <coughs> how we can assist with that type of activity as well. The Northeast Kingdom in Vermont, um, a bailer. You know, these things wear out and they're very critical pieces of equipment there. So, so you could define a project as a bailer and a rock crusher, come into us and we look at that as a total project cost and see what the grant percentage you might be able to help out with or loan, um, and then hopefully enable you to be able to assist. And then the wind and solid waste district, as I mentioned, was a front end loader. We are currently having conversations with them for a covering for their composting facility. They're the second largest composter, I believe, in the state of Vermont. Um, and you know, when you're composting that amount of material, you need to cover it up so it doesn't just leak into the rivers and streams when it rains out, right? So we're, uh, we're looking at uh, assisting them with some uh, recovery for that, as well as some equipment as well there. And then in Bethel, Vermont, uh, you know, scales. That's another thing a lot of these facilities have or need. Um, and we were able to help them with replacing the scales uh, at their facility there. So that's contact information. Uh, I did bring some handouts for all the programs we do offer and the grant eligibility for communities in Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, on this slide, you'll notice that the website is identical except the suffix. So if you're in Rhode Island, put an RI on it. If you're in New York, put an NY on it. A and M E, and you'll get to the local site there. If you have no luck there, call me. I'll find out who the heck you should be talking to in the other states and be able to get you connected. Um, probably some of the most important things to understand is timeline, right? So we're a federal agency. We get funded October 1st through September 30th. Uh, depending on the program, it could be a national offering, a NOFA, or it could be local. Uh, the community facility program is local. Uh, you can submit a paper application and <coughs> submit it into our portal and talk to people on the phone that are going to process your application. So, like I said, one of our strengths is we have a real strong local presence. We have three offices in New Hampshire and three in Vermont. <coughs> and again, uh, we'll get you the right person there. Um, Timeline is really critical. Uh, you all probably experienced capital budgets, capital needs. Uh, you got to think ahead. Chris and I are talking about that. That you know, mandates that come now don't always line up with funding opportunities. So I always say early and often talk to us about what you have so that we can help you 
navigate that resource there. Um, at the time of application, if you are a grant eligible community, match should be identified because you don't want to get hung up about that. Grant dollars are so finite and they're, they're uh, so sought after. Uh, we want to make sure you're in a well prepared position to be able to do that. As I indicated, if you're not grant eligible, you are loan eligible potentially if your population is under 20,000. So the benefits of our program, like I said, is when we process an application, we get to the approval, we obligate the money in your name and pocket with a fixed interest rate on it. You do your project, purchase your equipment, things like that, we reimburse at the end. Uh, if it's a loan, then if the interest rate went lower by that time, we'll give you the lower interest rate. But it mitigates the risk of interest rate fluctuation in this environment. Your project is inevitable and imminent. Uh, borrowing money at a lower rate is not such a bad strategy to get your project done because, as we all know, I don't think anything ever goes down. It always goes up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as, as bad as the D word is, debt, um, our debt is probably one that's very, uh, very beneficial to entities. Uh, let's see. I've covered all the highlights there. I'll, I'll stop there. Again, uh, I have some materials, uh, you know, my contact information, and uh, I don't know if we're going to go into a question and answer here at this one. So thank you very much. A lot of good information for sure. Uh, we did learn we have to yell at kids more because they're wasting and they're flying in the state house. So, a lot of good information. Uh, any questions? Here. Oh, sure. You know, it's, it's the last slide. Somehow or another, it got um, missed some, um, this, you know, whatever. The order got a little long with Tara. I don't think I don't think you pushed it on. And this is being recorded, so it will be available online on the NRRD website. So, one question I have um, is how often can we actually apply for these grants? Can we do it every year? Is there a limit? Uh, for, for our particular community facilities program, we get an annual allocation from Congress. Um, we do try to aggregate demand by putting in some uh, deadlines to, to uh, have applications submitted, but it's rolling. You can apply anytime during the year. Uh, the funding cycle, like I said, you know, it starts out strong, and then we get a lot of people in the queue, and then we don't have as much money to go forward. But uh, my 32 year history with the department, uh, it's not if we ever fund something, it's when. So um, it's annual and uh, anytime we try to aggregate the nails. And, uh, we get appropriations every single year. So it's a, it's a very consistent program, I would say. And for us, the, the two grant programs I talked about, the education and outreach and SWIFR, solid, solid, solid basic infrastructure grants, uh, brand new grant programs do not have anything like a history. I expect the RFA will be out in September. We just give you 60 days to apply. Our Healthy Community Grants is an annual grant solicitation, generally comes out in March. And I, I mentioned it just closed on, on May 9th. So um, that one's pretty consistent. If you Google Healthy Communities and EPA Region 1, uh, you can see that. Uh, or send me an email if you make sure you're on the list for next year. Um, do you provide loans or grants for rural uh, gravel roads? So roads are an eligible item that we can fund. Um, I think there, there might be better tools, like the Department of Transportation might have more uh, granting opportunities. But yeah, no, we, we've done, uh, as we indicated with the uh, Epic we've done bridges, and roads are certainly eligible as well. I would like to say about our application process. Um, 
as a federal agency, if you submit an application that's incomplete, we don't send it back to you. We send you a letter saying, thank you. Now you know what's the rest of the stuff. Um, and we have a back and forth. People always ask about how long the process takes. Well, it all depends on how complete the application was and how much you go back and forth uh, in the environmental issues and so on and so forth. Uh, we can do those type of projects, uh, but again, we always try to figure out what's the best resource for you uh, to be able to access. Yeah, unfortunately, um, our grants are one and done. You put in a grant application, you get a thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, we're not as nice. So. <laughs> but I will say, um, for example, Radian and I talked before our solicitation went out, so I gave her a really good idea of, you know, what you needed to do um, in our has not applied in quite a while. So um, as long as our grant solicitation is open, we can have a conversation that is a little bit more um, collegial and helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Question for Max. Um, on the rural grants and loans, there is a population criteria, and is there also a household median Income criteria that you can satisfy. So, so um, for our housing programs, income is very sensitive. We need to evaluate that. That's definitely an eligibility criteria. For our lending programs, uh, not so much. And for our renting programs, it, it's census data. So, so basically, we're getting the MHI, median household income, and the uh, population of the service area, typically it's a municipality, so it's talking about a town. Um, and we just use that data to determine what percentage grant they might be eligible for. And that's why some <laughs> communities are not grant eligible, however, loan eligible if they're still under the 20,000 population uh, criteria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question for Christopher. As you've tracked behaviors over a period of time, have you yet gotten to seniors who have been through your educational program from elementary on through? <laughs> and the reason I ask is that in 20 years of doing college university recycling, ironically, the worst behaviors we had were the students who had had elementary education about recycling. By the time they got to college, they only associated with elementary school little kiddish stuff. And it it was something that turned them off to the behaviors of college. And it was, I'm wondering if you're seeing that similar trend or if you're able to target your educational message as they evolve through the system. That's a good question. It's, it, it's new for us to be to be tracking it. And, and we, we finally really figured out the idea about um, having a, a way to identify them and you know through the lunchroom number. So we just started collecting that, that data and um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing really what happens in the in the long term. I have a question for Krishana. Um, how are you getting people to participate in those wonderful programs that you are offering, which sound like they're mostly educational? Um, just just curious. Of course. So the um, the educational programs are directed or geared towards the youth at MLCS. Our partner organization hires um, throughout the year, so um, so it's offering a trying to stay away from a didactic approach and really making it really fun and engaging um, these popular education strategies um, to take a really heavy um, technical um, termed product and technical um, topic and turning it into something that is digestible for them. So target target population are those youth that are hired. Um, and then at the celebratory event that I mentioned, um, having the youth share that experience with their community residents. I also had a question for you. Um, you mentioned briefly that one side project is educating around date labeling, and I just um, wasn't quite sure if, if what that meant. Is that just for like expired? Of course, yes. So, um, so date labeling in terms of that date that is on food products that tells you if a food is expired or not. And, um, and the reason we're doing that is, you know, Yamo is also working on another project in the Onondaga County, uh, Syracuse area of New York that focuses on prevention tips for food waste for residential. 
Um, so kind of borrowing what we've learned about the eight labels and um, that there's no set law that requires manufacturers to label based on safety versus um, just setting it to get it off the shelves and move it really quickly. So sometimes you'll see, you know, families will see that, you know, can of beans is labeled past date. It's still safe to eat, but because of that label, they end up throwing it out, creating food waste for, for food that's still safe to eat. Ironically, there are no federal laws for date labeling, except in the formula. That's another story. So date labels are generally, you know, peak quality, um, and they're not related to safety at all. And I think uh, we all have a relative who goes into the refrigerator, throws out the yogurt, you know, the day it's expired, and it's perfectly healthy. And we always just say, be practical, right? Use your nose, use your eyes. You can tell when something's something's bad. So date labeling is a huge issue. This question is from Heather, who is, uh, she's watching from home uh, to Rhode Island is how she put this. Have you had other states inquire about your programs? Um, it sounds like a great tool to repeat. Uh, we have not, although we have, we have reached out to, to other states and our toolkit is really based upon a toolkit from Illinois. And we work with them to actually customize ours, but uh, I have not had another state uh, reach out. I would say we've also looked at Vermont, which Vermont has been a, a, a leader. We've done a lot of education from Vermont. I have a question for Rhode Island too. <laughs> 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 Mr. Ackland. Um, I noticed when the legislator was talking about um, the bill that she introduced to require the diversion of food waste, she said that it wouldn't become effective until there was infrastructure available to receive it. And I just wondered, I wondered how all well that worked out because one of the problems with these laws is having structure to receive the things that you're banning from the way you did, banning from the landfill. Yeah, no, that's a good question. There are um, a number of composting facilities that have opened since since the, the, the bill was signed into law. Uh, some, um, there's a, a couple that had started and then realized it wasn't for them and closed. I would say the biggest challenge that we've got is it's not so much the, the uh, capacity to be able to find uh, composting facilities, it's transportation. It's far more expensive to transfer to transfer food waste to a composting facility than it is just to throw the trash and have it brought to the landfill. And that's, that's really the challenge that we, we've got right now. I would say we, with specifically with schools, we tested something this past year that worked out quite well is there is a composter called Bootstrap Composting. They're in Rhode Island, they're in, in Massachusetts as well. And they have a residential composting component where they'll, for a certain fee, they'll come to your house and they'll pick up your, your, your food waste. And so we asked them if they would give us a discount for the schools, so they would pick up at a 50% discount to the schools. If in return, we would promote them to the parents of the student body. And it worked. It um, they they were able to get some some good press in their in the newsletter and get some customers out of it. So we, as an organization, realized that we have to solve the problem. We have to drive down the cost of, of transportation. The other thing that we, we we looked at is the hauling agreements. The haulers are going and they're showing up once a week or twice a week. And some of these contracts with schools, therefore three or four years. And, and uh, so we've tried to open up the contracts, have a component where they start picking up the food scraps because truly the waste stream, 70% of it in the schools that we work with, it's the lunchroom. So if we can reduce the, the waste by 70%, there has to be some offset in the contract. And so that's those are things that we're looking at. I made a quick before that there's more states that have legislation about organics and landfills. Three of those states have what I call it, if you build it, they will come. 
And that's what I think she meant. So the law says if there's a facility, and it's a little bit different in each of the three states, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Vermont, 15 or 20 miles from where the waste is generated, you must go to a facility. If there's not a facility in that radius, then you're exempt from the law until a facility is there. Massachusetts is the only state in the, in the New England region where all bets are off. You, you know, there is no transportation distance. Um, and also in Rhode Island, which was interesting because it's such a small state, it didn't have to be a facility in your state. Um, we did some mapping, so it could be a border state, Connecticut, um, Massachusetts. And I think Chris mentioned that you're using some some um, vendors in, in Massachusetts with the schools. So if you know that they will come, is kind of what I think she was driving at in that message. I would just add that, you know, we, my presentation talked, you know, focusing on the solid waste of uh, those type of facilities. We can finance schools as well. So if the school had equipment needs to be able to compost or, or aggregate the, the material, we could help them with that. Um, if there was a non-profit or even a school that needed a vehicle, we could probably find, finance that as well. So, so again, um, you know, it, it's not always just your organization that has needs. It could be departments or some of the other entities that you're hearing, like they would love to do that, but they needed more bids. Or, and, and as we know, money's tight. We, Love to have a conversation with anybody and anyone that uh, has a need like that. Time for one more question. Well, it's a little bit more of a statement. My name is Andrea I'm with the NRRA, and I'm happy that you can add us to the list of USDA Rural Utilities Service grant recipients for our Recycle Right campaign and our Solid Waste Advisory Team program that we have running right now. So, thank you. <laughs> And thank you for the plug. And I, and I always say that, um, you know, all the resources that we represent here um, are just pots of money. But without champions like NRA and yourselves out there, they honestly want to engage and access those programs. That money sits idle. So thank you all for, for being applicants and, and weathering through the federal application <laughs> process. Um, and if we can help to get you through those type of things, we'd be happy to hear. Thanks.